There's the Oracle or price feed and stability mechanisms. Then there's like governance, censorship and control levers. And so there's a couple different vectors uh, along which you might characterize something as centralized or decentralized. And to date, uh, there's certainly not one at any sort of scale that is a decentralized stable coin. Even the ones that people point to, the original one being DAI, but DAI is obviously now split into two. Uh, even ones like Rai and others that are gyroscope, that are more quote unquote, pure play decentralized stable coins really still have this mechanism of either an Oracle or set of Oracles that they rely on that are pegged to USD. And if you're pegging to USDC, that is naturally a decentral or a centralized uh, mechanism that is controlled by a, a government. Then you have governance mechanisms that are on chain, but still kind of like controlled by a DAO, often by big players. Uh, then you have kind of certain, if you want to be compliant, certain censorship or control mechanisms. Uh, so I think it's really interesting when people just say, decentralized or centralized as if it's like a binary mechanism, um, but it isn't. It's a bunch of different vectors and it's kind of a spectrum. So in your view, what is the proper or actual decentralized stablecoin look like? Yeah, so <clears throat> maybe just to give a little bit of kind of like context of the existing stable token market, uh, just to try to make yeah, it simple. Um, the oldest form of this, uh, was actually USDT, um, USDC is a much, much newer comer than USDT, yep. but those two assets represent, um, just collateralized stable tokens. So you have a bank, you have an, an issuer, they hold money in the bank. And then supposedly for every dollar they have in the bank, uh, they'll create a receipt for an on-chain dollar. And then if you redeem that dollar, they'll destroy the... Um, sort of receipt, and they'll then pay that dollar out in a normal sort of fiat denominated account. That's what we would call a custodian stablecoin. Um, after that, the sort of second class of stable token was introduced. Um, I think DAI was probably the first one to do it. Um, and Certainly at scale, yeah. Yeah, so make, make or die would be the other... Um, form of it, and this is this is a concept of a stable token that's based off of a collateralized debt position or a CDP. And that's really kind of what you need for an algorithmic stable that's pegged to a fixed asset. Um, you're going to have some amount of assets be taking risks against some other set of assets. Mm -hmm. um, so basically people are going long and short, that's where the debt positions come into play. Um, so you basically have Maker, and Maker is backing up. It's the governance sort of token for DAI, but the value of Maker is sort of backing the peg against DAI. Right. So if DAI is to sort of uh, break the bank because CDP is going to close fast enough, that comes out of Maker. And sort of the more pressure there is on DAI, sort of the um, value is lost from Maker is, is kind of sort of how the setup uh, goes now with CDPs. There have a from a decentralization standpoint. If we assumed that we kind of had like a good oracle, they're they're technically not a terrible design in terms of decentralization. There's an issue of like I have this governance token that the governance contain can change the contract. The contracts can update. You could hypothetically have a static contract that can't be updated. Now that gets rid of that problem. Then the second problem though is like what do you do about the um, oracle? Right. right. And if you're going to a pegged market, you're always going to have an Oracle problem. And we've actually seen a number of stable tokens and then DeFi protocols and lending protocols get hacked because of issues with Oracles or liquidity in Oracles. And then people can exploit that through a process of flash loans. And then you can suddenly drain like entire DAOs with hundreds of millions of dollars right. because this Oracle was able to slip the price for one block and then suddenly all the money's gone, right? right? So oracles are a very pernicious thing uh, because something like a dollar market relative to um, Maker or Ethereum, you don't have really good, robust oracleization mechanisms. And I don't think you can really get rid of those. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of like an issue that that has. Now, the other issue that's maybe economically more interesting is the fact that 
Dai was probably actually responsible for the 96% retracement in Ethereum's value in 2017. Like Ethereum corrected harder than almost any other asset. Mm -hmm. And if you actually watch why that correction was taking place, it's because um, DAI vaults were getting liquidated. So what ends up happening is with the CDP, you can leverage, you can take leverage on Ethereum. It's only leverage of like one and a half percent. But as there's pressure on the value of Ethereum, your funding rate goes up. And so then your like collateral keeps like shrinking faster and faster and faster. So you were paying say 3%, then you're paying 5%, then you're paying 15% on that money. And simultaneously the prices of Ethereum is dropping and you still have to maintain the over collateralization. Um, you end up getting these situations where these uh, CDPs get liquidated and those the liquidation process is effectively selling that ether at market. And when that happens, it causes this like positive feedback loop where if the price of ETH drops, CDPs get liquidated, the price of ETH drops again. CDPs get liquidated, the price of ETH drops again because it's just this cascading like um, hitting of like limits right. that are taking place. Um, and if you look at the retracement on Bitcoin, it wasn't nearly as bad as, as the retracement on ETH. So um, there's issues of centralization there. There's issue through the oracleization and the governance. The governance one might be able to be solved. The economic one in the CDP is actually pretty pretty like terrible right. as a design mechanism. Um, you're, you're almost better off just like exiting into dollars. Because if I were to like exit in and out of dollars, um, you wouldn't have these like positive systemic feedback loops during these points of uh, price right. crashing. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, you know, when I look at like the stablecoin market, the current market you're talking about here to give some context, obviously, when you look at reports, it's absolutely dominated by USDT and USDC, both in terms of the market cap or monetary base of those assets, as well as in terms of like transaction volumes. But in terms of number of projects, I'm actually seeing a, a proliferation and a long tail of interesting new projects. And some of them are, you know, other centralized USD projects, uh, like from PayPal and others. Some of them are USD centralized ones that offer native yield. Some of them are non-USD fiat ones, like in Euro, Great British Pounds, you know, things like that. Uh, things that are centralized, but commodity-based, physical commodity-based, like gold or silver or some other metals, things like that. You're actually seeing ones that are now trying to be privacy-oriented, but they, but when you peg it to a quote-unquote RWA, a real-world asset, fundamentally you have that. Oracle slash stability mechanism CDP structure that has vulnerabilities. Now people are getting better at it um, and I'm hopeful for that. But one that like kind of part of that tale that I'm really interested in is not physical commodities, but more physics based commodities. And there's a couple projects in this like Quai that are based on computer energy. And I think it beckons the question of what we actually mean by stability.